you all excited to be here? Say yes. Listen, I love you, YWI National Conference. This isn't a conference for me. This is family. It's one of the few contexts in this world, really, that I don't feel like just a story. I'm just family. And uh, many times, sometimes I can feel exploited for my story, to be a champion that uh, some group or demographic is being uh, favorite, uh, giving favoritism towards minorities or, or at least caring for them. But here, I don't feel like that. I just feel like part of the family. And so if I see you outside in here, I don't know strangers. I just know family. I want to do life with you. Um, they're probably going to put my social media handle on there. Don't follow me. Join me. I want to do life with you, all right? Um, but I just want to give honor where honor's due. I don't know if Larry's in this building, but, man, I love you. I want to be like you when I grow up. You're the most approachable leader I've ever met in my entire life. And uh, I'm so excited that I get to do life with you guys. My task is at hand. I got a lot to say in a short time to get there. So I talk fast. Can you listen faster? All right, and this is an urban conference, so I need you to be a little urban. If you preach back better than I preach, we're in the building, all right? And so uh, my, my task at hand today is the God who breathes life into impossible situations. And I kind of just called it impossible is nothing. Touch your neighbor and say impossible is nothing. I, uh, how many visionaries and dreamers do I got in the house? Just raise your hand. I need to see you. Shout out. I'm one of those. I got a new dream and a new vision every day, and I got a wife that shuts them down every day. I'm like, baby, we could do this. She's like, baby, go to sleep. I'm like, baby, I want to try this or do that or whatever, and she's like, you playing. Stop it. You ain't going to do any of that. But I've always been a visionary and a dreamer. I mean, when I was 13 years old, I sat in my room and I looked at the ceiling, and I thought I was going to be the leader of the Onda because I was raised around some Chicanos and Essays and Vatos. That were hardcore. Now I'm in New York, so I got Puerto Rican poppies. A little different. Um, but I was raised in, in this context that I, I was like, yo, my dream was to lead the gang. But coming out of homeless shelters, my dad going to prison for 25 years when I was 8 years old. My mom moving drugs in and out of the prison system when I was uh, through my teenage years. And then in my teenage years, she picked up a crack cocaine addiction, morphed into a crystal meth addiction. And, but I was still a dreamer, and I walked my, into a local youth group and gave my life back to Jesus. And I would go to this, this one park in my neighborhood, and I would kind of overlook this, this bluff, if you will. It was kind of like this. And I would overlook into the distance, and on the other side of the city, I was up on this, this park over here. And I always walked with my pit bull because that is the Chicano mascot. And so I made sure I always had him. And I would walk in hard. You know, you do the lean, and you make sure he pulls. And, um, and so I had my pit bull, and I would sit there, and I would just dream. And I would say, God, I hope that you would ever use me to touch a city, transform, and be a part of your transformation, redemptive plan in the earth. And I would just dream, and I would look over at the houses on the foothills of the other side of the city, and I would think, man, I don't know how I'm ever going to get there because this valley looked like death for me. Because I would go home, and I would read my Bible, and I was falling in love with Jesus, but my parents were selling meth out the house. I was falling in love with Jesus, but my mom was smoking and addicted. My, my stepfather was, was a heroin addict and full-blown, and, and, and my, my father's in prison. But I'm sitting at this valley, and it just seems like death. There's nothing that can happen in my own power that can cross this chasm. There is just a separation that I don't know how to get past. You know what I think? I think that God has been inviting visionaries and dreamers, and I believe we have some in this room, to look out into valleys that look dead for a long time. He didn't start with me. He's not going to end with you. He's been doing it for a long time. And I think our text opens up with this. God is bringing a young man to, to the bluff or a cliff to look over a valley, to look over at an impossible situation and know that God is the only one who could breathe life into that place. And so he brought me to this place. What is that place that you're looking out into right now and saying, God, would you use me? Is it the pipeline from schools to prison? Because it's not a pipeline anymore. It's a highway. It just looks dead. And so our text opens up with this scenario. If you'll turn in your Bibles with me to Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37. It may be a familiar passage for some of you, especially this is leaders. What I would ask if it's ever a familiar passage, don't make assumptions. And hear it afresh. Amen. I'll go ahead and start. Uh, Ezekiel 37, 1 through 14. I'm going to read 14 verses at a Christian conference. We're going to read the Bible. Say Amen. The Lord took hold of me and I was carried away by the spirit of the Lord to a valley filled with bones. 
He led me all around among the bones that covered the valley floor. They were scattered everywhere across the ground and were completely dried out. Then he asked me, son of man, can these bones, live, can these bones become living people again, O oh, sovereign Lord? I reply, you alone know the answer to that. Then he said to me, speak a prophetic list, speak a prophetic message to these bones and say, dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I'm going to put breath into you and make you live again. I will put flesh and muscles on, on you and cover you with skin. I will put breath into you and I will come into, and I will, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I spoke this message just as he told me. Suddenly as I spoke, there was a rattling noise all across the valley. The bones of each body came together and attached themselves as complete skeletons. Then, I was, then as I watched, muscles and flesh formed over the bones. Then skin formed to cover their bodies, but they still had no breath in them. Then he said to me, speak a prophetic message to the wind, son of man. Speak a prophetic message and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, O breath from the four winds, breathe into these dead bodies so they may live again. So I spoke this message as he commanded. And breath came into the body, so they all came to life and stood up on their feet, a great army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones represent to the people of Israel. They are saying, we have become old, dry bones. All hope is gone. Say, hope is gone. All hope is gone. Our nation is finished. Therefore, prophesy to them and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Oh, my people, I will open your graves of exile and cause you to rise again. Then I will bring back to the land of Israel. When this happened... When this happens, all, my people, all my, my people will know that I am the Lord. I will put my spirit in you and you will live again and return home to your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray no one sees Gabriel today. God, I pray we will see you, Jesus. I pray that we would grow in the knowledge and revelation of the person of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, amen. amen. I don't know what bones you're looking at. And I don't know what that looks like. I know for me sometimes I think that uh, I thought I had been redeemed from the, the narrative that was and had gotten out of the hood. But I can tell you this, the second you go into ministry, it's not like, you know, I, I, was, I was about to sing this a whole new world. I was getting Aladdin on it. I was like, oh, baby, this is like we in ministry now. It's a whole new, you know. <laughs> and, but, and when I walked into it real quick and found out there's concrete walls everywhere and the bones do look dead. And burnout began to encroach upon me. And I was like, what is going on? And from the exterior looking out, it looked like uh, it was, there was incredible fruit happening. Took over a group of 40, turned to hundreds, had thousands of young people come through the doors. And we didn't play games. It was a move of God. And it was just incredible. And I was, but I was sitting here and saying, God, but there were some students that didn't seem like they were getting. I don't know what your dead bones are. I know that we all. If you're honest with yourself, know that not everything's perfect at home and some of us are still being redeemed from our stories. Yo, it's one thing to be in urban youth ministry, but if it's not just a people you serve, but it's also your experience, that comes with something. Yeah. And so you're still being redeemed from your own story. My daddy's still in prison. And so, I, you know, it was this, into this, these dead bones, and I'm looking over, but I believe that God sees those dead bones, and he knows. And only if he breathes life into them can they ever come to pass. So three things I see from this text. Number one, his promises. Number two, his person. And number three, our practices. Number one, his promises. And number two, his person. And number three, our practices. And number three, our practices. I don't know what that valley is again. I don't know what neighborhood it's looking at, but I know this. When God calls you to a valley, he gives you his perspective on it. He's not going to call you to a place that he does not open your eyes to the spiritual realm and what he's doing. Because God does not need what we're doing. We have great initiatives. We need what he's doing. And so, number one, uh, the promises. It says, listen to the word of God the Lord. Listen to the word of the Lord. What did I say? God declares something. What God said is so powerful. If you turn to Genesis chapter 1 in verse 3, it says, God said, let there be light. And for, for four days, uh, he doesn't actually create the sun, the moon, or the stars until the fourth day. But for three days, light was still there. In fact, on day three, uh, uh, vegetation and plant life begin to grow because his word was so powerful that when he said it, it's sustained light itself. And so we're going to anchor what are these uh, believing into these dry bones on the promises of God. We have to know what he said. The, pro the, the disciples said, we're waiting for what he had promised for the day of Pentecost. What did he say? What are we waiting on? You know, one thing I believe about Dr. King is that he didn't believe his speech and the social justice movement that was birthed out of everything that he is and what he stood for was not because he, he was a giant in social justice philosophy, 
or that he was a, a giant in sociology or that he believed in the process and that people would actually get it right. I believe he believed in the promises of God. That Genesis chapter 1 verse 27, that we're all created in God's image. And if we're created in his image, then there is one race. And so he believed that boys and girls from different races can all play together. I think he believed in Galatians chapter 3 verse 28, that there's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female. Y'all thought you were up on the women's, you know, fighting for women's rights. Jesus was up on it year, thousands of years ago, just letting you know. All right? And so for thousands, he was, because of those promises, Martin Luther King can stand up and say, I have a dream. Not because I'm, I'm, I'm anchored on reasons, on process, not that any of those things happen. Listen, if we're waiting for moral legislation to get it right and for politics to fix our problems, we're going to be making a long time. But if we wait on the promises of God, baby, we got something to stand on. Because he is the promise maker. He is the promise keeper. Listen to what the Lord has said. What has the Lord said about your neighborhood? If you don't know, you need to start listening. If you've never heard God speak, get your Bible and read it out loud. Because there's promises there. There's promises for you. There's promises for your students. Because you, want, you cannot speak anything out over a valley of dead bones if you do not know the promises of God. If you do not know what he has actually said. Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will last forever. Not our initiatives, not our programs, not our marches, his word. I said it. Isaiah 55, my word will not return on back to me void, but it will accomplish that which I sent it out for. His word, his promise. Do you believe his word? Say yes. yes. His word, the second thing is his person. His person. It says, you alone know the answer to that. And Ezekiel appeals to God's person, not his ability, his person. And verse 13 says, then you will know that I am the Lord. Many times I think that we do this. We believe in God's ability, but we do not always believe in his character. Mary and Martha in John chapter 11, Lazarus is died. And, 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 and they come up to him and, and, and Martha says, if you had been here, Lord, he wouldn't have died. Not, not, listen, because if you were here, I believe in your ability to raise him from the dead. But because you weren't here, I don't believe you wanted to. His character. In Matthew chapter 8, you see the, 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 the disciples, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 4, you see the disciples uh, sitting in, in the middle of a, and the boat's being rocked and Jesus is sleeping at the bottom. And they say this, don't you care? We're about to sink. We're about to drown. Don't you care? Because in their mind, they thought if he cared, he'd be awake and rebuking the storm. But if we're going to believe that God still touches valleys full of dead bones, we have to believe in his person, his character, not just his ability. My wife and I have been married this October for eight years. For eight years. And uh, we, 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 had, we didn't have kids for six years. Somebody say amen. I highly suggest it. Don't have kids for six years. And man, we turned up. We did whatever we wanted. It was incredible. We had sleepovers. All the time. It was amazing. Um, but Mark and I, we, we turned up. We, we had a lot of fun, and we went hard after Jesus, man. We, we, went, we went out to school together, and, uh, and we, we, we traveled the world together, did missions in Thailand, Laos, Malaysia, Indonesia, Central America. We went all over the world. We, we turned up. We didn't get in no debt. We were like, we're going to live on faith. We're going to stay slim and trim. That way we could just pick up and go whenever we wanted to. It was amazing. We turned up for six years. Six years, you're looking to get married, raise your hand. When you do get married, wait half a decade, it's incredible. <laughs> and so we'd been married for six years and we had this incredible thing going on. Uh, we, we called it sleeping in. <laughs> Woo! We would sleep in, it was amazing. You know, I was like, we would wake up at 10, 11, whenever we wanted. It didn't matter. We could stay up all night, Netflix and chill, sleep till 12. It was, I mean, we, it, was, it was incredible. And then we had this little niño, my firstborn son. And uh, he had this thing uh, in his mind that if he didn't sleep, nobody sleeps. And so he would always be up in the middle of the night, and we'd like do this thing where I had to sleep train and get him to sleep and do all this stuff. And so... We find again to start sleeping through the night at around eight, nine months old. We're like, man, this is amazing. And so the deal was my wife would wake up with him Monday through Thursday or Sunday through Thursday. 
And then on Friday and Saturday morning, it was dad's job to get up with the baby. So he'd wake up early. Because listen, those of you who ain't parents, listen, let me tell you something. You don't get sleep when you're a parent. You get rest. <laughs> sleep is done. All right? It's done. So on Thursday morning, though, I would try to do this one thing. I would just sit there and my son would wake up and he'd be like, dad, dad. We'd hear him crying in the other room in the crib. He's crying, Baba, dad. And I would stand still like, don't move, don't move. Don't let her know that you're awake. And you're, like, and you're like praying to God, like in your mind, you're like, God, I pray that this woman gets up in the name of Jesus. I pray that she knows I worked hard all week. God, I pray right now that she would feel an unction from the sovereign Lord to go pick up my son and let me sleep for another hour. Come on, some dad, say amen. And, uh, and so I'm sitting there, and you know she ain't moving. She's like, you've been here all Week and I've been up all the other days. So I'd be saying, Dad, Dad, and I'm like, man. So I would go get up and I would go into his room and it was dark. I would walk into his room and I would pick him up and he'd stop crying. And it was still dark, so I'm kind of like walking over and trying not to stub my toe on toys because that's another thing. And I'm trying to walk through and get through and, you know, I'm, trying, I'm almost like doing salsa and whatever. And so I'm getting through the room, I finally get through and my son would stop crying. His situation hadn't changed, he was still in the same room, the room was still dark. But there was something that had changed in his experience. He was in daddy's arms. The person that he had called upon had answered. The person who he was calling from the other room had came into the place. Listen, listen, faith is not knowing how the dead bones are going to come to life. Faith is not even knowing where you're going. It's knowing the one who's taking you there. It's knowing the one who listens. You know, my son does not know how he's getting through the room. He just knows he's in daddy's arms because he's his daddy's son. Hey. Yeah, that's my son, right? Because my son, there is something inside of him that evokes something inside of me called fatherhood. When I hear his voice, I have to respond. My person has to respond. And then he says, cry out to the Lord. What are you not crying out for? Because his person is evoked by your voice. His person, his character is moved by what you say. Do you believe that? Say yes. Because faith is not knowing all the details. Faith is knowing the one who controls the details. His person. Amen. Listen, faith is not a distant view. It's not looking out into the future and seeing what God may do. Faith is not a distant view. It's a warm embrace of Christ. It's knowing that you're in his arms. It's knowing that he's got you. Because you are your daddy's son and daughter. You are your daddy's son and daughter. Amen. He is moved by your voice. Matthew 19, 26. We may never see God move in the impossible situations until we actually step out. Because Matthew 9, 26 says this. With man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Do you believe that? Amen. All things are possible. Amen. We have to believe in his person, not just his ability. Amen. And the third thing we see in this text, he tells Ezekiel, prophesy. He tells him to do something. Our practices. It's not enough just to believe in his promises and his person, but you must believe that your your by our faith is made evident that we believe his promises and his person when our practices line up. When our practices line up. He said, prophesy. It wasn't just enough to hear the word of the Lord, to know that he carries the answer, that his person is the one, his character. He actually wants to do something, but it was something that Ezekiel had to do. Now get up and prophesy to these bones. Get up and do something. Many times we pray for an answer, only to find out you're the answer. God, save this neighborhood, and you're standing right there. God, save this young person. And you're standing right there. Because it's our practices that are made evident. It's the interdependency of our walk with Christ. Faith without works is dead. Faith without hustle is dead. Is dead. And so our practices have to line up. It's the two walks. Listen, to walk efficiently, some of us may not be able to do that because of an accident or, or an amputee from war, whatever have you, but I believe in glory. We'll all walk on two feet, but two feet is the most efficient way to do it, and our, our walk with Christ is walked out on two feet. Faith and obedience. Faith and obedience. God loves people, therefore I go. God said it, therefore I believe it. It's made evident by what we do. 
It's not enough to make a Facebook post, where's our practices? It's not enough to, to cry out that no one's hearing our narrative and we're not being an agent of change. Our practices, what are we doing? Because it is, it is irresponsible of all of us to have a conviction without accepting responsibility. If you have a conviction that you believe the church needs to be more racially diverse, then get some diverse friends. Hello. Hello. If you believe that the pipeline from schools to prison, I was on that pipeline, baby, and I cut the cis. I beat the, I beat the odds. If you really believe that's becoming a highway, what are you doing? Because a week and a half ago, I was sitting in front of five MS-13 members and just talking with them for three hours. Are you going to be a part of the agent of change because it's made evident by your practices? Amen? Amen. Listen, I looked over that, that valley. And everything didn't change for me overnight. And I, and I walked into ministry and I figured, God, I, don't know, I know you did it in my life. I'm believing that you can do it again. And I pray that you would do it again. But it was my practice is God show up every day. It's the faithfulness of God. God, I don't want to be famous. I just want to be faithful. Just be faithful. 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 Day in and day out, show up. Show up and love somebody. Show up in that neighborhood. Show up at that school. Show up in your marriage. Show up in your job. Show up. Our practices. Our practices. Amen? We've got to show up. One of the most scary passages in all the Bible to me is this. 1 Samuel 13, 13. I would have established your lineage forever, speaking to Saul, if he had been obedient. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Now, I believe in the sovereignty of God, and we can stick that in our theological pipe and smoke it. His actions changed God's mind. So something about our practices matters. God, if you want to save this neighborhood, get up and prophesy. Get up and do something. Because our practices do matter. Amen? I prophesied, and I would dream over that, that, that park, and I would speak over and over. God, I pray that my mother would be set free from drugs. God, I pray that my brother would not be a statistic, that he would find you, Jesus, and that he would get away from the gangs. I would, I would prophesy even to my, to my own situation. God, I pray when my dad gets out that we would have a relationship. God, that I would not be bitter, that I would be mended. God, I pray you'd use me for your glory. Can I tell you something today? My mom's been off of crystal meth for eight years. She went back to school. She's a public school teacher. My brother, he's in law enforcement. I mean, seriously, that's, if that ain't God, I don't know what is. And my dad gets out this Monday, 25 years. I haven't held my dad. I haven't held my dad since I was eight years old. I only seen him through a glass window three times in 22 years. I haven't held him in eight years. And on Monday, I'm not bitter. I'm not angry. I'm not mad. I'm going to hug that joker. I'm going to help him get a job. I'm going to help him get on his feet. Prophesy to dead bones. Because his promise is sure. His person is good. And our practices matter. I don't know what you're looking at. I don't know what your neighborhood looks like. And I don't know what situation you're facing. But I believe we still serve the God that breathes life into impossible situations. God decreed with his word creation. But he breathed life into man. He saves his breath for us. He's breathing life into all of us. Amen. Listen, if you believe you're, you're called to see God move in impossible situations. And you want to prophesy to some dead bones, I want to pray with you. Would you just stand to your feet? Just stand to your feet. Put your hand over your heart. I want to pray for you. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray over every neighborhood represented. God, that transformation would take place because this urban youth worker is there. God, I pray for those who are going through their own problems. God, I pray for health over their sickness. God, I pray right now that they would be encouraged, that they would be imparted to today. God, that, they, that life would come into our own personal lives. And we declare right now, under the, in, by, praying under the mighty name of Jesus. God, make dead things live. God, turn it around. In Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. I love you all very much.